Hello, it's John Heaton. Today I'm going to firstly take you through my latest acquisitions because I'm still on a bit of a roll in terms of finding new stuff um, or old stuff. And then I'm going to talk a bit about a couple of articles I've recently read, which I think can be described as sloppy journalism or whichever word you want to use, provocative, uh, sensationalist and basically uh, pretty much inaccurate in summing up what they're talking about, but we'll come to that. So found another new record shop. They seem to be, seem to be finding a new one every uh, couple of weeks at the moment, but I don't suppose that'll last. But this one's called MG Records, and it's um, in roughly the same area as the others. You just have to walk 10 minutes further. And it mainly deals, in fact, it exclusively deals in new vinyl and new CD, so you won't find secondhand records. But I did find some very good bargains there and stuff I've been looking for for a while, including this album from 1998 from Eric Clapton, Pilgrim, which is a double album, double vinyl, because it's an hour and 15 minutes long. And I think it's a great album and it was only uh, the equivalent of 15 quid. So very happy about that. It's got Steve Gadd on it, Nathan East, um, among others, Andy Fairweather Lowe's on one track, recorded partially at Olympic Studios in Barnes, which my friend Adam Daniels was telling me is now a cinema, um, which you can go to, and the actual cinema is where the studio used to be, so I need to check that out at some stage, because a lot of important albums were recorded at Olympic Studios, including The Stones and a couple of Beatles songs as well. So, very happy to have Pilgrim. I really do rate this album. Um, from the, the opening track, My Father's Eyes, which is just sensational. River of Tears is a glorious ballad. Pilgrim is a great um, title track. So that's side one. And then of the other songs, I like all of them. I like the cover of the Bob Dylan song, Born in Time, from Under the Red Sky. I think that's really nice. And um, I was reading that Stephen Thomas Erlewine in the All Music Guide was slagging off this album, saying the production was rubbish. but. Not the first time I've disagreed with uh, that gentleman, and I think, you know, although there are quite a few program drums on here, there's also Steve Gadd playing drums on more tracks than not. So I like the album, strong material-wise and, and not offensive production-wise. Next one I'm going to show you is the soundtrack to the famous cult movie performance from 1970, starring James Fox and Mick Jagger. Um, basically... Yeah, James Fox, in case I hadn't mentioned it before, used to live a couple of d doors away from my parents in Wimbledon. So got to chat to him over the years, um, bumping into him in Wimbledon. And although we didn't really discuss this film, because I, I think he was trying to distance himself a little bit from it because he, he'd he become a, a Christian in the intervening years. And maybe this film is a bit seedy. Um, but he's probably secretly pretty proud of it. But the most, the, the most conversations I had with him were about Bob Dylan. But this, this um, comes on a very nice yellow vinyl. And uh, I never had this album before. In fact, I hadn't even realized it was out on new vinyl. And it's got a particularly tr strong track called Memo from Turner, where, which is written by Mick and Keith. Um, so it's, I don't think there's any other tracks sung by Mick, but very nice to have. Quite a depressing movie to, to watch, but uh, as I say, one of those cult movies, a bit like Clockwork Orange. Now we've got Lindsay Buckingham's new album, which I picked up down in Seged. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll bother to do a separate review, but it's um, a very pleasing album. One of his better solo efforts, and I would say the standout tracks for me by quite a distance are the closing track on side one, Blind Love, and the opening track on side two, Time, which are just glorious. And the harmonies reminiscent of Save Me a Place from Tusk on the, on the latter track. And Blind Love is one of those effortless melodies that he comes up with, a bit like Steal Your Heart Away. Uh, Santa Rosa is another very strong one, Blue Light, strong. The singles are, are okay, but not, not my stand-up tracks. So nice effort there from Lindsay. Uh, this was a strange one. Mike Woffard, who's a jazz pianist, done some, has done some, did some interpretations of Steve Scott Joplin's work in 1976. But as with most jazz in, impressions, um, you can't really hear the original tune too clearly because it's kind of obscured and made into a kind of jazz style. 
which is not my favourite, but it was interesting to listen to. He's a good pianist and he's got a guy on drums and a guy on bass backing him up. And what's interesting about this album for me is, um, is uh, the fact that he's chosen some eight obscure tracks from the aborted opera that Scott Joplin wrote before he died, which didn't actually see the light of day in his lifetime, Tremonesia. And this is a 1976 recording from Houston. But uh, Joplin worked for years on this and was trying to get a promoter to back it and, and failed and got very depressed as a result and that kind of led to his mental health problems. But uh, nice to see, you know, Frolic of the Bears, a uh, real slow drag covered on here, albeit in different style. That was that. And I picked up this in the MG Records, the new record store I found. And this was not expensive, around £10 equivalent. And the good thing about this glorious Mirage copy is it's on violet vinyl. And I think this is one of the nicest coloured vinyls I've ever seen. And perfect cover to have, colour to have to match Stevie Nicks's top there on the cover and some of the colours on the back are kind of violet as well so I think that was a good choice um, of colour. I'm still looking for the Tusk album on silver vinyl, haven't seen that yet. Uh, and then I picked up this at a very, for some reason this was a bargain bin price, five pounds equivalent. And this is the Warren Zevon Excitable Boy album uh, in, with the glow in the dark vinyl. No, it's not dark, so I can't show it to you glowing, but I did test it out yesterday. And this coloured vinyl, if you turn the lights off, it lights up. So very unique. And I um, ended up getting two copies of this because I had another copy in there. So one for my son and one for me. Uh, if I see another copy, I might just pick pick that up because at, at that price, uh, I'll just pick any, any copies up that are going and uh, maybe I can give them away to people and stuff. So that was my recent finds. And now I want to talk about some articles which I read recently which are, upset me a little bit. Uh, the first one was the coverage of McCartney's book on lyrics coming out last Friday, all the headlines in all the papers. But Paul McCartney claims that he wrote Day in the Life, not John Lennon. So I thought, what the hell's going on here? So I read the articles and they jumped on one tiny remark from mainly from the Barry Miles book from 1997 uh, saying he helped write with John write, write the words, blew his mind out in the car. Um, and he didn't think it was about Tara Brown at the time. And now in his interviews to promoting the new book, he says he think it was, I wrote about Tara Brown in Day in the Life. So he's a bit... Paul's contradicting himself there a little bit, perhaps due to his uh, fading memory. But um, bottom line is, I, I've always seen this as a, a joint composition between John and Paul. And all Paul is saying is he helped out with the lyrics. And uh, we all know that he came up with the line, I'd love to turn you on. And uh, so he might have helped with a few of the lyrics in the, in the verses as well. It was written pretty much together from what I can gather. And... Um, including the, you know, the gap in the, uh, after I'd love to turn you on, they thought, well, we need something special to lead up to the, the middle, the bridge section. And then they, so I, I've always thought, and of course, Paul wrote, wrote the fell out of bed bit. So to me, to my mind, this has always been a joint composition. You know, Lennon's probably got the lion's share of the credit for it over the years, because he sings the lead vocal in the verse, but Paul was playing the piano to great effect. And, um, yeah, I just, I just kind of was a bit put off by all the headlines saying John Paul claimed he wrote Day in the Life. Well, he didn't. If you read what he said, he didn't try and claim sole ownership. All he said is he helped out with some of the words. And obviously he wrote some of the tune, but uh, they like to make a story. Uh, another article recently written by Jeff Herbert um, was trying to make out that the Beatles had a near reunion in Syracuse not only in 1971, but also in 1974. Well, I've been studying Beatles for 45, 50 years, and I can't recall any inkling of a reunion in Syracuse. I think there was more of a chance of a reunion at Bangladesh a couple of months earlier, August 71, but that fell um, 
that didn't come through, as we all know, because George and John had an argument about whether Yoko should have participated. And as far as I know, in Syracuse, well, we all we do know that it's just John and Ringo there in John's hotel room and singing various songs, including Yesterday and Uncle Albert, I think. But um, George Harrison apparently was going to fly over, but I've never heard any evidence of that. I think it was just wishful thinking on the part of the hotel manager trying to bump it up to be a story, a bit like the Campuchia said there was going to be a reunion before that concert, and there was no truth in that. Um, and Paul was certainly no chance of him being there. So I, And then in 74, May Pang, they quote May Pang saying, Syracuse would have been the per perfect place to reunite. Well, I think the closest that John and Paul, well, they did meet, the two of them, but uh, they never met in the presence of um, George and Ringo. And uh, although George and Ringo did work with John on I'm the Greatest from 73, that's probably the closest uh, they came to reunion. I haven't heard a 74 Syracuse reunions being a, anything more than a wishful thinking on behalf of someone. On behalf of someone. Um, as we know, John was on, invited to go down to New Orleans to play with Wings in 75. Maybe that would have led to something. But uh, basically, these articles tend to latch onto one thing and say, yeah, and then sum it up as if it's history and it's not. Um, it's just speculation. Um, and then which brings me to the probably the most annoying article of all from Ed Power, I think his name is, writing in The Telegraph. He, he's been slagging off the ABBA reunion before it's even begun. On August the 26th, he wrote an article in The Telegraph saying that ABBA did misery really well and contented old age will not suit them. And this is before their single even came out. And then just the other day, he came up with an article saying, are ABBA quitting now because their new songs were such a disaster? And he... Well, reacting to the news that ABBA have announced that Voyage will be their last album, well, it's hardly surprising. I mean, it's not as if they're going to come up with a string of albums. We're lucky enough to get one. And um, he, prepa he pr um, tears holes in, in the singles and said they didn't do very well in the charts. Well, I don't think any of the, the older artists do particularly well in the singles charts. Singles charts is largely meaningless. I think it's the album which will be the make or break of the reunion. And... Uh, by all, but from what I can gather, that will be a huge hit globally and uh, probably hit number one in several countries. So to write it off as a disaster before the album's even been released is quite staggering. And um, he even has the audacity to quote three artists in defense of people who have moved with the times or adapted a bit better or coped with old age a bit better, uh, whereas ABBA haven't. And he quotes The Stones, <laughs> who have been obviously stayed together since night, since the year dot, but they haven't exactly changed their style or anything, and they're together f mainly for financial reasons and for people who haven't seen them ever in concert. It's nice to go and see them, but uh, I don't need to see them again. But it's not as if they've reinvented themselves. Elton John, he's saying, oh, he adapted to the times by doing this r recent duets album with all these modern people. Well, again, I, I think it's just trying to trying to have hits and Elton John's music for the most part, since the 70s, hasn't been on the same level as his peak period in the 70s. Uh, a couple of exceptions, like um, Captain and the, and the Kid and stuff, and a couple of good albums, songs from the West Coast. But on the whole, he hasn't changed one jot, really. And if he has, he's just trying to have a hit, like, like Paul uh, collaborating with Younger Arsis as well recently. And then he quotes McCartney's latest album as being dynamic and heartfelt. Well. Maybe the ABBA album will be dynamic and heartfelt because you haven't heard it yet, Mr. Ed Power, because it hasn't come out. Unless you're, uh, unless you've got a crystal ball, you don't know you don't know what the album's like. Okay, you're entitled not to like the singles, and I tend to agree they're not quite as up on the same level as the older stuff. But how could they be? I mean, we're, we're talking about setting an incredibly high standard of songwriting. So I'm glad we're glad. To, I'm glad to have a new ABBA album. I'm going to judge it when the time comes out. And sorry to you, all you people out there who watch my channel and are not fans of ABBA, but I had to mention that because it was annoying me that someone would dismiss it without even hearing it. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.